pleased to welcome uh, Anita Simmons. Uh, before she gives uh, a lecture, I want really to congratulate her for the year no lecture she was awarded in this Congress. I'm also very pleased to do so because I was a, a previous recipient <laughs> <laughs> of this. And I, I really congratulate her for all her scientific job. And now she's going to talk about the ASV. What do we know now and what do we go? A very difficult task, I must say. It is. Uh, and I thank you for that comment because you were a very hard act to follow. So yes, the, the, these are difficult questions. What do we know uh, and what do we do next? I'll try to add some clarity on these three issues and particularly uh, where we move to in the future. So first, I think we have to start with the SurveyHF trial, which you will be aware of. In particular, the inclusion criteria for that trial was it was evaluating adaptive servoventilation in stable heart failure patients with reduced uh, ejection fraction. These were systolic heart failure patients. Their left ventricular ejection fraction was less than 45%. Uh, and they had predominant central sleep apnea. So that was the particular question that was posed, and it was a, one of the biggest studies done in respiratory medicine, and the results were presented last year. Keynote findings, of course, was that the primary endpoint uh, cumulative um, index, uh, combined index of all-cause death, life-saving cardiovascular interventions, unplanned hospitalizations, and so forth, was neutral. There wasn't any advantage in this particular subgroup of systolic heart failure patients with central sleep apnea, no advantage of adaptive sober ventilation over the control group. And importantly, the mortality endpoints, both uh, overall mortality and cardiovascular death, was significantly increased. You can see the p-value was, was uh, positive in this group of patients. So we learned something important in that we shouldn't use adaptive sober ventilation in that group of patients with central sleep apnea. However, we don't know the answer and that we have no uh, safety warning or safety concern in those with preserved ejection fraction, those with um, uh, an ejection fraction over 45%. Um, and we also don't know the answer, uh, uh, nor should we be overly concerned about treating patients with mixed sleep disordered breathing and obviously uh, obstructive sleep apnea, as they were not included in that study. So having set aside those groups of patients, and perhaps we'll come back to Holger at the end for some of the other work that's being done from the registry at looking at um, ASV in, in those individuals with preserved ejection fraction, I will focus for the rest of this short presentation on three other areas which I think are of interest and in that if you work in a sleep lab, these are quite difficult issues to manage on a day-to-day on -day basis. One is complex sleep apnea, then there's uh, central sleep apnea from a variety of other causes, idiopathic causes, following uh, um, strokes, for example. And then finally, another group that I think is really of interest, and we're beginning to understand that there's a real growth area here, is opioid-induced sleep disordered breathing. This is just a, a polysonography data from a patient in our lab. He's on CPAP, as you can see, but. Um, on, on treatment, you can see these central events, breakthrough events here, um, which had not been seen to a great extent. I mean, he had severe obstructive sleep apnea, but the definition of complex sleep apnea is central sleep apnea emerging in patients with predominant obstructive sleep apnea when they start on CPAP therapy. Been a variety of estimates of prevalence. I've taken one figure here, but some people would estimate the prevalence is even higher 15, 16 percent. Uh, we have uh, some idea of those uh, obstructive sleep apnea patients who are most likely to convert into complex sleep apnea, um, such that they have very severe obstructive sleep apnea. There is already some evidence of central sleep apnea at baseline and other factors such that they're taking uh, opioids. This is a prospective randomized controlled trial of CPAP versus um, ASV in that complex sleep apnea group. And an important factor about complex sleep apnea is that a proportion of those patients, the central sleep apnea will resolve over time. 
course, you don't know which proportion that's going to happen in unless you monitor them. And uh, this really speaks to Holger's comment at, at the beginning on the use of telemonitoring and telehealth. Just to inform the management of those patients, this is a study about 66 patients included. What they did was uh, assess them. You can see the breakdown of hypopneas, um, obstructive events, and central events at, break, uh, at um, baseline. They then had uh, CPAP started, and then they were re-examined after 90 days. So this was a long trial, and after 90 days, they were either randomized to have optimized CPAP continue or optimized ASV, and I think this figure is the most helpful one to understand what happened for the 90-day patients. And whatever criteria you look at, whether you reduce the apnea hypopnea index to less than 10 or less than 5, you can see that a greater proportion of patients in the ASV group achieve those targets um, either for less than 10 or less than 5 than in CPAP. So this suggests that uh, in this complex sleep apnea group, adaptive server ventilation will be, may be more effective in controlling events. I think it's fair to say, though, that in terms of symptom relief, there seems to be no obvious difference between the two groups. So we still have some question marks as to what we do with that group of patients. Um, and there's uh, some other studies that are listed here from a nice pa a paper that I'll, I'll reference later. Um, take-home point is, although this was a long study, this was the one I just showed you. Most of the other studies are comparisons over one night, so we certainly need longer-term information. What about central sleep apnea in patients following uh, cerebral infarction? Again, I've just taken an example of a patient that we saw uh, in the last few months. This was a man who had a frontal ischemic event uh, which caused um, anger and tantrums and mood changes, so it was really quite difficult for him to cope with devices, cope with sleep studies. Um, but you can see from uh, this data, this respiratory sleep study, a lot of events which are predominantly central, although some mixed events too, and a very classic de detectable on an oximetry study. This man couldn't even cope with CPAP. He found it very difficult to use for the whole of the period, and so it was difficult to get a sleep study on CPAP. But the comparison here that I can show you on ASV, which he coped with much better and slept better, you can see so spontaneous breathing, just the same as this study, uh, in terms of oximetry, which we, it was possible to monitor him on at home so he didn't have to come into hospital. This is before he put the device on, and we have got some few events, but quite significant improvements on ASV, and he was able to use it and, and felt better. So these are quite tricky patients to manage. The opioid-induced uh, opioid sleep disordered breathing group is a, is a very interesting one. Uh, just before coming to the Congress, there was uh, reported by the ATS, there's uh, big pressure in the States for physicians there to stem their prescriptions of opioids because there's huge growth in, in prescriptions of, of a range of them. Uh, you can see here 700% over, over 10 years and it's still increasing. What has become clearer, though, is that these patients uh, on opioids have a whole mixture of types of sleep disordered breathing. Um, one of the prevalent studies in this population showed as almost two-thirds of patients on opioids had sleep disordered breathing with an AHI of greater than five. And you can see for severe sleep disordered breathing, it was just under 20%. So this is an issue. Um, and when uh, uh, five studies looking at prevalence were com combined, there was the suggestion that uh, around a third of them had central sleep apnea. I think one key factor here is that all central sleep apnea is, is, is not the same. The mechanisms for it is not the same, and the management of it for understandable pathophysiological reasons is not necessarily going to be exactly the same. And the patterns that we see are unlike the chain Stokes type respiration that you see in heart failure patients. And this opioid-induced group of patients 
um, may have complex sleep apnea, they may have obstructive sleep apnea, they may have central sleep apnea, or if they are taking opioids and combining them with other medications, um, such as morphine and some of the patients we've seen are on a whole panoply of different drugs for chronic pain, then there may even be an element of hypoventilation and that needs a different approach as well. This is a sort of central sleep apnea you can see in an opioid user and it's quite a chaotic pattern and it's not particularly like the chain stokes respiration as I said sometimes called biop breathing but the real key here is there is a variability in breathing rate in tidal volume and duration of the apneas and another example here that you can see that kind of pattern um, and again just showing the types of mild moderate and severe and some clustering of events but no um, waxing and waning as you would see in the heart failure patients this was a, a study trying to compare different um, positive pressure approaches. So this is a baseline um, study, central sleep apnea in an opioid user. Case example, actually CPAP in this patient made them worse. They tried adaptive servo ventilation, and although the result was better than in the CPAP uh, uh, night, there were still issues with control. And I think what this raised uh, is that you need titration of your settings, and even the authors themselves recognized that they had not optimized the ASV in those patients, in that patient. Um, and so that may be a, a potential problem. There has been a, a, a more detailed, so that was just a case example, but a more detailed comparative study by K.O. et al. Uh, comparing bi-level non-invasive ventilation with a backup rate, so this is bi-level ST uh, ventilation and adaptive server ventilation. I mean, intuitively, in some ways, these patients, um, certainly the ones, the opioid users rather than the um, morphine type users tend to have a normal CO2 or even a low CO2, so why you would want to use bi-level ventilation in that group um, is questionable, but it's really important to know because many people have um, bi-level machines available and, and want to try them. The bottom line result from the study, however, was that, as you can see on respiratory criteria, Compa the, the comparison, the bi-level device was not able to suppress the events as much as ASV overall for AHI, for central events in particular, and for respiratory arousal events. And there were improvements in um, sleepiness and alertness during the day, and a sort of headline there that respiratory event rates were normalized um, in over 80% of patients by ASV auto, but only a third of patients on bi-level non-invasive ventilation. So bi-level is not really a particularly important op op option in those patients. This is the uh, review I mentioned that one of our uh, chairs was involved with just uh, giving a kind of overview of the studies of ASV and opioid users. Um, again, we have an issue that most of the comparisons are, are one night and not over a longer period of time, but um, you'll have these slides in, in case this is of use to you. The point was also well raised by uh, Wilfred Randerath and uh, Javahiri that a lot of these patients on opioids, they have chronic problems, chronic pain, they may require orthopedic procedures, they come into hospital and they require surgery. And how do you manage these patients? Because as sleep physicians, respiratory physicians, we may be called by the surgical teams and the anaesthetists to assess them and understand uh, exactly what's going to happen in the, in the post-operative period. And this is quite a nice um, algorithm, uh, doing a sleep study, identifying whether it's predominantly central sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea, focusing on adaptive server ventilation predominantly. And I think this just is on best evidence grounds, obviously, rather than randomized control trials. Um, CPAP, obviously, for those with obstructive sleep apnea, and for that group in whom complex sleep apnea arises, then one can use adaptive server ventilation too.
So the key conclusions, I would say, is that the mechanism of adverse events in the systolic heart failure patients with central sleep apnea, as we saw in the Survey HF trial, is being determined. There's lots of publications coming out showing that this is likely to be mediated by a sudden cardiac death in the, in the community, and that suppressing chain Stokes respiration is not uh, in the interest of the patients, but that is a different group um, to those with other sorts of central sleep apnea that we've just been discussing. It may be used beneficially in those with complex sleep apnea. Uh, it requires us to carefully determine the type of sleep disordered breathing. As you see in the opioid users, there can be all sorts of different types of sleep disordered breathing and we need to titrate and adjust our treatment to that. We can. Um, be careful in the heart failure patients. We need to understand what their ejection fraction is, and that usually means getting an echocardiogram, because as we've uh, seen, those with an ejection fraction less than 45%, we should not be using ASV. But those with preserved ejection fraction, uh, ASV is, is a, a, a perfectly valid uh, treatment option. We may make further ground with ASV algorithm changes, particularly in these new types of uh, central sleep apnea patient. And we also, as many of them have mixed events, need to be um, thoughtful about our titration of EPAP to deal with those obstructive problems. Caveat as well, as well as absolutely making sure that we don't have um, severe heart failure, is we have to exclude hypoventilation, hypercapnia, because those are the patients that should be treated with non-invasive ventilation. And I think what's been interesting, and we've learnt a lot and we've had surprises along the way with ASV, particularly with CERVHF, but what it really has done above everything else is, is really help us understand um, the pathophysiology of sleep disordered breathing, and that, that can only be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very comprehensive review and uh, extremely uh, clinical oriented. That's very good.